Guys, good evening. It's great to see you. Great to be in devotions with you tonight. I was just uh, sharing our broadcast off of the church Facebook page onto my personal Facebook page. And uh, it's kind of, it's just kind of interesting to me how I am looking into this camera and this is being broadcast onto our church Facebook page. And so everybody who is tuned in with our church Facebook page can see it there. And simultaneously, right now, I'm sharing it off of the church Facebook page onto my Facebook page. And so then any of my Facebook friends can see it and watch it also. And so it's just kind of cool. Um, I'm having a lot of fun doing these daily devotionals. And uh, I'm, I'm growing in God's word myself. And, um, and so I'm very thankful for the opportunity. You know, when I was a seminary student, I remember reading uh, about Luther, who at, for quite a while in his ministry, he preached every single day of the week. And he had a pattern of, uh, of how he went through the books of the Bible uh, in those sermons. And I remember as a seminary student, you know, reading about that and thinking, wow, that's pretty cool, you know, because that's really your calling as a pastor is to be a, you know, a minister of the word, a minister of the gospel. And, uh, and so to be doing that every single day, that's, I mean, what, you know, it's, it's hard to top that, you know. And so um, that's something I always thought would be neat. And, um, and now, you know, um, this coronavirus is a very serious thing, but one of the, if we dare say, positives that's come out of it um, for us, for our ministry, for me, is the daily devotionals. And so just very thankful for that. I want to encourage you, like I try to do every time, to share this broadcast with other people. You can share it onto your own social media, too, from Church's Facebook page. Just hit the share button, and it'll share onto your social media, and your friends and acquaintances can see it as well. Um, Definitely use lots of positive uh, emojis, thumbs up, smiley faces, hearts, all of that. When you when you do that, you are boosting the ranking of this video, and um, and you're so you're doing the work of an evangelist, and 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 that's that's pretty cool um, as well. I want to encourage you to take advantage of the resources that are on our social media, whether it's Facebook or the website or the YouTube channel or whatever it is. We know that most of the people watching the video uh, videos are not members of our church, and that's great. Um, anything that's there that you would like to take advantage of, modify, adapt to your situation, please do that. Uh, it's there for you. We, we would love to help in some small way the proclamation of the gospel. So please take advantage of it. It's there, it's there for you. Um, let's bow our heads. We'll have a quick prayer, and then we're going to jump into God's Word tonight. We're continuing in uh, our final week of the Red Letter Challenge. This is this wonderful resource by Pastor Zach Zender, um, LCMS pastor, fourth generation. And uh, this final week, we're looking at going, going and proclaiming the good news. And tonight, we're going to talk about being a witness and, you know, what does that mean? Really looking forward to sharing with you. We're going to look at one of my favorite passages, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We'll talk about that here in just a little bit. Um, Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for today. We thank you for your love and your mercy. It's new to us every morning. We thank you for all of your blessings in our lives. We thank you for the good work that you prepared in advance for us to do. We thank you for the good that we were permitted to do. We also ask for forgiveness for those places where we chose not to um, do those good works. You know, And please forgive us of the really poor excuses that we made up in our own minds. Uh, about why we shouldn't or wouldn't or couldn't and didn't do those good works. And, um, and so, Father, I bless us with a good night's rest. Let us rest comfortably in your arms. Uh, let us uh, know that we are loved by you and provided for by you and um, that you have our future in your hands. And so, Father, bless us tonight and... Uh, uh, we just thank you for this day, and we pray that you would bless us with a good night's rest, that we would awake refreshed and restored tomorrow, that we would be uh, about your work. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name, according to your will, and for your glory. And all of God's children, we all say, Amen. Amen. Guys, it's great to be uh, in devotions with you tonight. Um, we are on day 36 in the Red Letter Challenge. 
And the uh, verse here that Pastor Zender focuses on is Acts chapter 1, verse 8. So let me uh, read it for us. Uh, I'll just read the whole verse. He has just a little snippet of it there. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says, uh, Jesus says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Um, this uh, text is the text that my dad used when he preached my um, installation service after graduating from the seminary. You know, that was obviously it was a special day for Kathy and I, and our family was a lot smaller back then. It was uh, Jacob and Jim. They were a lot smaller back then. And, I, you know, this, this passage has always um, been uh, a passage that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, you know, Acts chapter 1, verse 8 uh, says, you know, just says, you will receive power. And the Greek word there for power is dunamos, and that's where you get the English word dynamite. And so the, the power that Jesus gives to us is very powerful. It's, uh, it's, it's powerful enough to change eternity, the eternal reality of people. How is that possible? Because we are given the Holy Spirit, we're given the means of grace, uh, faith comes through hearing the word, and the word is the message of Christ, and, uh, and this is the word unto salvation. And so this word that we are given and these sacraments that we are given are very, very powerful. Um, I, I remember more than once as a church planter thinking to myself, uh, you know, that being a church planter is kind of an interesting thing because really all you need is a stack of Bibles, some water, some bread, and some wine. And <laughs> by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can, you can go plant a church. And, uh, and it's, it's really, it's an amazing thing, this power that God has given to us. And, uh, and so we, we need to um, cherish this power that God's given to us. We need to respect it. Uh, we need to use it. And, uh, and we need to delight in it and rejoice over what his power accomplishes because we go in the power of the Lord. Um, so Jesus promises us, you're going to receive power. So in and of yourselves, you don't have any power, right? Um, you know, Moses, you know, right? Uh, being called by God, I, who am I? You know, we, we don't have, Paul says, you know, remember what you were when you were called. You were not much in the eyes of the world. We don't have power in ourselves. You know, it's not through fine sounding arguments that people um, uh, are, 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 are led by the power of the Holy Spirit into a saving relationship with God. It's not through fine sounding human arguments at all. It's, uh, it's the work of the Holy Spirit convicting a soul that uh, it is in need of a savior who will redeem that soul from its sins for time and for eternity. And so we need to stop looking around for power in other places. God's given us all the power that we need. And that doesn't matter if there's a coronavirus going on or there's some sort of cultural shift going on or I don't care what it is. The power that we have is from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and it is more than enough for whatever we're facing. Amen? <laughs> I just get passionate. <laughs> Amen, right? Give God a thumbs up, smiley face, hearts, positive emojis. Give God a praise clap. Jesus says, you will receive dunamos. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. When the Holy Spirit come upon you in the waters of your baptism. So you got that power. You've got that power. Woo! You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. And that's really what we're here to talk about is that word, witnesses. I'm just getting a little excited. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the very ends of the earth. You know, when I uh, heard my dad preach on this verse, you know, I, I got very excited, you know, um, to think about that, that the, this progression, this, uh, this uh, expansion, that we're going to be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, the very ends of the earth, you know, that's exciting stuff. That's awesome. I mean, that's great. And, and you know, uh, it was 24 years ago that I was ordained into the public ministry. 
And I still get excited about this. That fire has not gone out. I, I am just as excited today, maybe more excited, um, because the gates of hell will not stand against the church. The church will overcome it. And we already have overcome it through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He has already won the victory for us. I've read the end of the book. We're on the winning team. Amen? Amen. Amen. In the chapter four today, Pastor Zender makes a couple of important points I want to just reference here quickly, if I can. Uh, I think one important point, the takeaway that I have from his chapter, uh, for his devotion for today, is uh, uh, this, this sentence that he has in there. People connect with you when they hear how God has made an impact in your life. So when we're talking about witnessing, Pastor Zender makes this really good point. People connect with you when they hear how God has made an impact in your life. And this is absolutely a true statement. And, and here's, the, here's kind of one of the great things, really. You know, I, I want you to stop and think about this for a second. We live in a postmodern, subjective society. We live in a postmodern, subjective society. And so what does that mean? That means basically that, that according to the culture that we live in, that we determine, each individual person determines what truth is. That's, that's essentially what it means to be postmodern subjective, that each individual determines what truth is. Now, you and I know that is a bunch of hooey because God determines what truth is. But that's the culture that we live in, that, that each person determines what truth is. So flip it to our advantage when it comes to sharing the gospel. Always look for the gospel handle. Always look for the gospel springboard. Always. We live in a postmodern, subjective society. Each person determines what the truth is. So when it comes, when it comes to sharing our personal testimony, nobody can say you're wrong. Not in a postmodern, subjective society. Because each individual determines what truth is. And so, and so you can share your personal testimony in this world, honestly, with probably more receptivity from people around us than 50 years ago when it was not postmodern. Does that make sense? Because um, in a non-postmodern world, then it's going to be more objective truth and people are going to try to raise more arguments. But most people in America, probably 80% of Americans, according to the polling, think in postmodern ways that they will determine what truth is for them. And so because that's the culture that we work in, for you or I to say, this is my personal testimony, they're going to be fine with that. Okay, that's your personal testimony. Tell me what your personal testimony is. And so, and so we want to, to be aware of our context and to be confident in our culture. Not confident in our culture because of the culture, we're confident because of Christ. Amen? Amen. Um, you know, I, to me, again, it's just like Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul on Mars Hill. You know, he looks at the context, he looks at that culture, and he quotes the philosophers of that day, and why? To then get to the gospel. And so, and so we likewise do that. Zender, Pastor Zender also makes a second point here. Uh, we do not go alone, we go with the Holy Spirit. And so that's, that's just, that's so comforting. In fact, the Holy Spirit is called the comforter, right? That when, when we go and we witness, which is what we're called to do, one of the things that we're called to do as Christians, that we, we do not go alone. We go with the third person of the Trinity. Amen? Amen. Um, now, I do want to talk to you about something that's pretty serious and, and pretty significant. And that is that the, um, we don't usually associate the word martyr and the word witness. We don't usually associate those two words as being synonymous. But the fact of the matter is that if you go back, the, um, much of the English language comes from Latin. Latin basically comes from Greek. And the Greek word... Um, the Greek word, which is the basis for witness, is also the exact same Greek word that is the basis for martyr. And so to be a witness and to be a martyr, biblically, you should know this just grammatically here, it comes out of the same biblical word. And, and so, you know, when you hear that for the first time, it's, maybe it's kind of shocking. My gosh, to be a witness is to be a martyr, that they both come from the same thing. But, you know, when you stop and think about it and then you do the, the word study and you go back and look at, well, where is this word used in Scripture? I'm going to give you two examples here just real quick. 
you go back and do the word study and look at where is this word used in scripture and then you see, well, my gosh, there is. There's a lot of similarity, a lot of connectivity between witnessing and martyrdom. So um, one that I want to give you here is Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 says, Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, exact same Greek word there, witness or martyr, Jesus Christ, who is the, and this is Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, if you're writing it down. Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, our martyr, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And so Jesus was literally the, underlying bold, the, true witness, the true martyr, the perfect witness, the perfect martyr for us. Amen? Amen. Then the second one I'm going to give you is Acts 22, verse 20. Again, it's going to be the exact same Greek word. And when the blood of the martyr, and when the blood of the witness, Stephan, was shed. So again, that's the exact same Greek word, translated as witness, translated as martyr, as it was in Revelation 1.5. And when the blood of the martyr, when the blood of the witness, Stephan was shed, and his, his blood was shed because he was a witness unto Christ, right? That's why he was stoned, right? And when the blood of the martyr, Stephan was shed, this is um, Paul, then Saul, speaking, I also was standing by and consenting and agreeing unto his death and kept the clothing of those who killed him. Um, you know, and I think, you know, we need to understand something that this is not just something that happens 2000 years ago in scripture. It's something that is happening today. In fact, um, there are more Christians being martyred because of their witness today than at any point in human history. Um, and so I shared a website there on, on our Facebook page, Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, it's, a, it's a good resource to check out. I want to encourage you uh, to do it, to, to check it out. Um, being a witness is something that we're all called to do, regardless of where we find ourselves. You know, I've, I've been a military chaplain now for a couple of years. And uh, one of the cool things about our church body with the military chaplaincy is that in our church body, the military chaplaincy is part of our missions department. It's always been part of our missions department because our church body has always looked at the military chaplaincy as having a missionary focus of going and, and being a witness and, and sharing the gospel, doing word and sacrament ministry. And so whatever conflicts our troops have been in, we've always gone and proclaimed the gospel there throughout, throughout history, you know. And so when I was getting ready to deploy to the Middle East, that was one of my prayers was that when I was on deployment, that I would be able to proclaim the gospel. You know, I'm going to go into the Middle East and we're going to be in a Sharia compliant country and that I would be able to proclaim the gospel. And little did I know uh, that where I was going uh, to Al Yadid Air Base in Qatar, that in Qatar, there are probably more Christians than there are Muslims. And you might say, well, how in the world is that possible? Well, the reason for that is very simple. It's an economic reason. Um, Qatar uh, won the rights to hold the World uh, Soccer Cup, I think they call that. And, uh, and so to host that, then they had to build all these hotels and venues and all this stuff. And uh, there's no way they're going to do that physical labor when they have all that oil money. So they bring in all these third country nationals. Uh, to do the work and these people that they bring in to do the work come from like uh, uh, the Philippines, from India, from Africa, and from countries that are largely Christian. And so there are, by most estimates, there are more Christians in Qatar than there are Muslims. And there's so many Christians there that the uh, emir of Qatar uh, then uh, allowed the Christians to have house church worship. And, um, and then that just w went crazy. Just to, there's just a lot of house church worship going on. And so then the emir then um, set aside a large chunk of land in downtown Doha, and it's nicknamed Church City. And there's nine massive buildings there. 
And uh, these buildings have massive seating capacity uh, in them. There's auditoriums in there that hold thousands and thousands of people. And you have worshipers, Christian worshipers there from 60 something different countries and no individual denomination owns any of these buildings. So they all work together and they work out a schedule of who's using what, when, and all of that. And, um, and while I was there at Al Udeed, we had the blessing to go off base and worship in Church City. And so I actually got to meet with the clergy person that the Emir of Qatar had appointed as, quote unquote, the Bishop of Church City. And so I met with the Bishop of Church City and I explained to him I was a Lutheran pastor and that back in the States, I worked as a missionary doing house church planting, working among immigrants. And so then the Bishop asked me, would you like to uh, preach here in Church City? I said, yes. I said, you know, are there, is, are there Lutherans who are gathered for a worshiping community? And he said, no. But I said, well, are there Lutherans there? And he said, yes. And I said, okay, well, um, that, that would be interesting. So he said, well, let me talk to them and, um, and we'll see if they will, you know, will invite you. So he did, he went and talked to the group and they said, yes, you know, we'd like him to preach. So I came out and preached for him. And uh, this was one of the smaller congregations. There's only about 650 in worship at that service. And, um, and so I preached for them and uh, shared with them that, you know, what I did back in the States, how I planted house churches and worked among immigrants and all of that. Long story short, you know, they invited me to come back and, and preach. This is downtown Doha. And I've got pictures of walking across the parking lot there with boxes of small catechisms that my friend Deaconess Carolyn Brinkley at Fort Wayne Seminary provided for me. And any of the people who were on deployment with me can, can, ver can verify that uh, I got tons and tons of these boxes of catechisms. And we just, we went everywhere. So anyhow, so took them down there and um, made sure all the children who wanted one could have one uh, during the Lutheran service. And, um, and so then, <laughs> and so then uh, after one of the services, when I preached down there, a Middle Eastern man came up to me and said, uh, the people in our home Bible study group uh, want you to come and teach us. And, uh, you know, I've never met this man before. And, uh, and he asked me, you know, will you come and do it? And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. And so then, of course, I started to pray about it. And, uh, um, you know, there are certain security things you've got to take into mind when you're in the Middle East. And so, <clears throat> so then I, um, I had different choices about how to, you know, try to be safe in this situation. Make a long story short, I asked my chaplain assistant uh, if he would come with me. I told him he didn't have to. This is no way I could require him to do it. He, he didn't even bat an eye. I said, yep, I'll go with you. So we got the address, we looked at it on Google Maps and found there's a couple mosques right around there uh, in that neighborhood. And so then we went there a little bit early, kind of drove through, went, there's a Dunkin' Donuts right there, went and got a cup of coffee. We didn't know, that, you know, we have our last cup of coffee together. And um, then, you know, we said a prayer and uh, found a couple more mosques in the neighborhood. And so if, you know, to the natural human eye, it's not a Christian community. There's mosques everywhere. Uh, no churches, you know, not visible, like what we think of here in the United States. And then uh, pulled up in front of the house and the man who invited me was there and, and he's, he welcomed us to come into his house. Walked through the doorway and uh, in that house, it was just packed with Christians from many, many different countries from all over the world. And I've got pictures of that and uh, it was just beautiful. And so I brought the uh, hymnals, the LSBs, and we had worship and they said, please teach. And I taught for about an hour and they invited me to come back. And that was really one of my highlights of, uh, I would say it was my highest highlight of, of my deployment, was to be able to preach and teach on deployment um, in a Sharia compliant country and to be invited into home Bible study and to be with that worshiping community. It's a tremendous privilege uh, and, and a blessing to be able to do that. And so I wanna encourage you, you know, last night I encouraged you to, to pray a very simple prayer. Um, you know, God, uh, give me somebody to witness to. And uh, I believe God's gonna answer that prayer. You know, now how that turns out is between the Holy Spirit and that individual. But I believe God will always answer that prayer. And so I want to encourage you to, uh, to pray, ask God to um, give you somebody to witness to, okay? And then I, I want to encourage you to share your 
Uh, the Greek word is amartia, your, your witness, your testimony. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe you've never really thought of, you know, what is my testimony? And your testimony is really very simple. It's simply, you know, Pastor Zender says it, you know, it's what has God done in your life? And, you know, don't worry about, is my testimony a cool testimony? I mean, I listen to some people's testimonies, and, I mean, it involves tattoos and Harley Davidson motorcycles. And nothing wrong with tattoos and Harley Davidson motorcycles. And, but you know what I'm saying? I mean, not all of our personal testimonies are crazy town, okay? <laughs> some of our personal testimonies are, are, are much more simple, you know? Um, you know, I, I was raised in a Christian family. I never knew a day in my life when I didn't know who Jesus was. I mean, that's just, I had very godly parents. And that's, that's my testimony. Sounds boring, sounds vanilla. Okay, whatever, but that's my testimony. Okay, that's mine. I'm still a sinner. I'm still somebody who needs God's grace. And, uh, and, and so what difference does that make in my life? Well, because I, I know I'm forgiven of my sins, I have peace. I know I have a great identity because my identity is in Jesus. I'm not that worried about my future because I know who holds my future. That's my testimony, you know? Um, that can be your testimony. You know, it, it doesn't have to be some crazy conversion event. Maybe it is, and, and, and that's great. It's not any better than anybody else's, but, but that's fine, okay? So what's your testimony? How, you know, how have you, is, how have you seen God at work in your life, and what difference has that made? So I want you to pray. Pray for the chance to share your faith with somebody and to give your testimony. It's a, it's a tremendous blessing when you when you do that it really is and so um i just uh, so glad to have this time with you look forward to our devotions tomorrow night as we continue in our week on going and sharing the gospel with other people let's go in peace let's serve the lord thanks be to god amen amen <laughs>